sure as people join in, um, they'll just pick up wherever um, we are as well too. And so welcome, good evening. Thank you so much for joining us this evening to give you some updates and tell you about some supports. I am uh, Janet Schultz, your superintendent, and so excited to be with you this evening and share some information. I wanna let you know that we have two American Sign Language interpreters joining us this evening. So I'm gonna ask um, our host here, Kevin, to pin them so you can see who they are. One is Michaela. There's Michaela. And the other is Amy. Oops, okay, and... Let me try Amy. Sorry, I have to move my screens around here. There's Amy. <laughs> and there's Amy. So they'll be alternating. So right now, Michaela is signing. So her camera is on. Amy's will be off during when Michaela is signing. And then when Amy starts signing, her camera will be on and Michaela's will be off. So it's helpful if you pin them, if you need um, the American Sign Language. And then this reminder that on Thursday, we will be having a Spanish language webinar with this same information as well too. I also wanna welcome two of our board members who are with us tonight. We have our board president, Dwayne Smith. Hello everybody, uh, glad to have you guys this evening. It's be good to hear uh, your concerns. Thank you. And we have our board trustee and outgoing president, Mr. George Miller. Good afternoon. There are quite a few people that's on this chat, over 200. So I'm excited, it's excited to see what's going to happen. And we also have a um, lot of people from our Ed Services team and our district team who will be presenting throughout and they will introduce themselves as their part comes up as well for the sake of time and then here to answer any questions. So we'll go ahead and switch to the presentation now. Okay, let me do that. And then if you have questions, we ask that you put those in the Q and A function. So that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You should see a Q and A. And if you type any questions you have about the content or questions that we that you want us to answer later on, we'll do our best to answer those and then add that into our FAQs. You can put any comments or anything also in the chat, but we're gonna separate our questions out as much as we can in the Q&A and then use the chat for any dialogue. So we will go ahead. And then, so our agenda this evening is I'm going to give you an update on the health updates at the county and what and our health updates for Pittsburgh and what it means for schools and how the state has the tiers and what that means for schools and any reopening. And so that will be the very first part. We'll take some actions, um, some questions, I'm sorry, on that part, but you'll, there'll be time for questions at the end as well, too. And then the Ed Services team will go through some of the supports that we have for families and students as well. And then at the end, we do have a few questions for you. Um, if you're able to stay, we've got a quick poll. You'll be able to see the results in real time. And that's really helpful for us. All right, so the next, present the next um, slide. Okay. So the state, the state of California has a tiered system. And so this is determined by the California Department of Public Health along with the governor's office. So the California Department of Public Health, the state makes these tiered systems, not the school district, but this is what we use in order to work within the parameters and with our county, we're in Contra Costa County and our county health department around decisions around school. And so the few things I wanna point out is that the state has a tiered system that's color coded and it's based on a number of factors, but mostly around the case rate, which is a seven day average of daily COVID-19 cases per 100,000. 
And the data is has a seven day lag because they need to um, allow time for the data to come in. So you're not seeing real time, it's a weak lag with that. And so you can see under the purple, that's what's considered widespread. That's what we've been doing for, for we've been in the purple for quite a while now. And that's when the case rate is more than seven daily per 100,000. Now, you may have heard that we just recently in our county got removed from the most recent stay at home order. And so we have been under that for quite a while. That doesn't impact our day to day in the school district in the same way, but it is good information to know with that. And then the next tier is the red, where that you can see the cases go down a little bit lower. And then the next is the moderate, even lower. And the next is the minimal, you know, where we would have very minimal um, cases of it. Okay, the next slide, please. Now, just to check, are folks able to see me? I'm talking with my hands and I wanna just make sure, are you able to see me as I'm going through this? Okay, <laughs> make sure. So, okay, thanks. I see a few yeses in there, so I wanna make sure with that. So what do the tiers mean for the schools? And so there's been a recent change and you may have heard about that with the governor's plan. Parts of the governor's plan still have to has to be approved by the legislature. But in the purple tier, again, the state, the California Department of Public Health sets these tiers, but in the purple tier that's widespread, before schools have, were not allowed to reopen at all for in-person instruction, there was a waiver that you could apply for for TK6. The new governor's plan, there's no more waiver and they've changed the rates, so the case rate. So in the new governor's plan, schools can open for hybrid for grades K through six only. So secondary cannot open in the purple and under the new governor's plan. And so, but if the new higher rate, instead of having seven cases per 100,000, you can have up to 25 cases per 100,000 and be able to do open for in-person learning. Again, opening for in-person learning means the hybrid model where you have no more than half your students at any given time, where if you, if you attended any of the ones in the summer where we made those schedules that we planned for, where you have half of the students in person, half at home, we have to keep a stable cohort. So that's what opening for in-person means right now. And so you can apply as a school district for, to be able to do this once your rates in a county are at 25 per 100,000. In that plan, you have to have COVID testing being done on a regular basis for both staff and students. And you have to have consultation with your labor partners to open or get permission to open under this plan. And that's what you may have heard of where the governor has some, some money, again, still has to be approved through the legislature tied to that to help pay for that expense. Now, our case rates you're gonna see um, in the next slide, but don't go to the next slide yet, but our case rates in our county um, have been much higher. So we would, we're not eligible to apply for this yet. Right? We're not eligible under this rate. Currently though, what you can do in school districts is you can have supervision of children. So you can have a cohort guidance. So we have some small learning hubs. You can have some athletic conditioning that we've been doing. And also there's a new update as of Friday, sports will be able to begin based on a tiered system. So the, the sports that are um, the most, um, outside, socially distant, independent would be under the purple system. So that is there. And you can do assessments and some services for students with disabilities and targeted populations. So we have guidance around doing those things. Once a county is in the red, then schools can reopen for in-person instruction. Again, hybrid model only. And once the, um, a county has been in the red for five consecutive days and you don't need the, um, the plan or the other approvals that go with it, you do need your labor 
consultation. You do have to bargain any effects of that. But the red tier is where the schools can have that. And then of course, orange and yellow would be the same. Going to the next slide. Let's take a look at where we've been in Pittsburgh. So all along as we've been monitoring the case rates of COVID in Contra Costa County, we've also been looking at the rates in Pittsburgh independently as well. And so we're able to get this data through Contra Costa County Health Services. They do it over 14 days instead of the seven days, but we're able to do a comparison between Contra Costa County and Pittsburgh. And because how Pittsburgh is geographically so contained and our rates have been so much higher this whole time, the Board of Education um, approved a recommendation that we will also look at the data for Pittsburgh along with the data for the county. So you can see that there's times when our county, because our county is quite large, our overall county average numbers might be lower, but Pittsburgh's are still quite high. We hope they all come down, but we know there are parts of the county and you can see that on the Contra Costa County Health Services um, website as well too, where there's parts, there's cities in the Contra Costa County who have a very low rate and cities that have a much higher rate with Pittsburgh being one of the cities that's had one of the higher rates all along. So you can see in October, when we started collecting this comparison, the difference, and then if you go all the way down to um, just today, the most recent, this is every Tuesday. So you can kind of see once a week snapshot of what this looks like. You can see the difference between the county and then how much higher Pittsburgh is as well too. And if you go to the next slide, I'm going to show you the same information, but in a graph format. So you can see if you're visual, I always like to see things visually too. If you see this visual, the blue line is where Contra Costa County is in the case rate. So you can see in October, they were down there in that 93. And then you can see where they are now in January. And we've had a slight dip in the county. So we certainly hope that that goes down um, even more rapidly to get down there. And then on the orange line, that's the Pittsburgh line. So you can see the case rates in Pittsburgh. So in October, we were fairly close to the county, but then really started having much higher case rates. And you can see, for example, here, you know, almost 200 more and then here, and that's been consistent. And then of course, with this most recent spike, we still are quite high up there. So you can see that's almost double the rates for the county. So we have to be very cautious in Pittsburgh. And of course, I know as the rates are higher in Pittsburgh, it means that more people in our community are impacted and we just send all of our good thoughts for everybody for, for um, keeping safe and healthy. The arrows on here are, if you go, there you go. The yellow arrow shows you visually where our county would need to be before our county would have permission where we could do the opening under sort of the red, if you remember the tiered systems, where our case rate would need to be for those five consecutive days before we would be able to open without having had all of the different items that we need to have for the governor's plan. So that shows you where that would be for the county. Now the green arrow shows you approximately where we would need to be in order to get the um, approval through the governor's plan. So you can see that we are quite a ways from that. So this is where we would have to be in order to apply for the grant funds. And then this is where we would need to be in order to open under the red tier. So you can see where we are in there. Okay, next slide. So the Board of Education supported the um, recommendation that we remain in distance learning through third quarter. And so we're there at least through third quarter, which for us is March 12th. We're going to continue to monitor the case rate of COVID-19 in the county and also in Pittsburgh and hope that it comes down. We can see that there's some trends coming down in the county, at least a little bit. 
um, in the last week. We know um, we can we know that the hospital rates are better because we were allowed to get off of that restriction from the state. So we just have to continue to be cautious, continue with those good practices. And then when numbers allow, what we have is a phased in approach, like you may have seen in other um, areas as well too, where we would start with our youngest students and phase in through that hybrid model. We do have to bargain any effects with our labor partners with this. And families will have the option for remaining in distance learning. So there's different pros and cons of the hybrid model. And so in February, we'll hold a set of um, webinars so that you can look at the examples. We do have examples up on our website of what we did this summer of what the schedules would look like, but we'll talk through those in February. So families can answer, que ask questions. We can give you the latest health data and you can see sort of the pros and cons um, for your family. And then we'll start to gather some information to see how many people in Pittsburgh, because we're here for you and our, our students, how many people in Pittsburgh are gonna be comfortable depending on what the numbers show, depending on vaccines, depending on your personal choices, going forward with a hybrid model when we are able to. And then of course, things can change. So things can change at the state and things can change with the federal government. And so any changes that happen we will communicate with you, but we have to be responsive to any changes that happen through the state and also through the federal government. And we certainly hope that we get more and more um, vaccines coming throughout as well too. I don't have a slide on vaccines, but I'm sure folks may have questions on that. Anything with vaccine distribution right now is going through um, all of the healthcare workers and people who are 75 and older and and folks who are in um, living in the congregant living centers who are 75 and older too. And so we don't have a timeline yet. We did have a meeting with Contra Costa County Health yesterday and we don't have a timeline yet on when that next phase would be um, available in terms of any kind of vaccinations for any other essential workers, including educators. So. They thought it was gonna be happening soon, but it's just been going slower um, than they anticipated. And so we don't have a timeline from them yet on that. So a lot of information on the health conditions. Before I go over, do you want me to answer any um, quick questions or anything about the data that I showed you? Janet, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, one question is, does PUSD currently have any academic learning pods on site? We do. We have a couple of um, learning pods and we have a couple of learning pods that we've done in partnership with our after school program and a couple that we've done in partnership with the county. And so we do have one at the Housing Authority. Um, we do have one at the Learning Center at 60 Civic. Those are the ones through the county. And we have one at two of our elementary schools um, that we have done with our after school provider. And we're working to try and get a few more of those as well too. Um, you know, you did talk about waivers and that we have not applied. There's some questions about private school versus PUSD, but this person may have came late. But again, um, why we're not open and some other schools are? Yeah, so we're not um, we're not open for a variety of reasons. So so we um, don't we don't meet the requirements right now through the Department of Public Health. So we don't have um, the requirements to we don't have the the case rate in order to open at all. There was a small window in October where in, where in Contra Costa County, the case rate was down and, and the county was in the red for a little bit. And so there were a few schools who opened during that time. Um, our rates were much higher during that time and we did not move for doing any of that opening. So that may be what you're thinking about as well too. The waivers were something that um, you also had to have certain numbers to meet and a lot of different requirements. And so I do know some private schools 
were um, did did go through and, and apply for those waivers, that was not something where we could meet those requirements. So that might might help answer some of your different some of the um, differences. There was a question if we've had to um, close any learning pods due to breakouts or illnesses. We have not. No, we have not. There is a question. Um, uh, I think this person understands we can't comment publicly or uh, on labor agreements, but um, they did ask about the status of, of labor agreements to return to school. And there's a second question. Um, has PUSD or CC Department of Ed secured a contract for staff testing? So in, um, in terms of labor agreements, we have, um, you know, that's part of the ongoing discussions with that. And as we get closer to the time, so we did, we initially did an MOU for distance learning, and then we did one for our assessments because we're doing some in-person assessments. So our next phase would be to start that conversation and start the bargaining for um, the next phase. In terms of the employee testing, we did decide to get ahead of the game um, before it was required, kind of thought that would be a good service to do and knew that it was coming. So we did do what's called a piggyback contract with our county office of ed with a company called Curative. And so we started our employee testing. It's optional right now. We started it as a pilot at the district office. I'm doing mine tomorrow. We're gonna to take some pictures and a little film so folks can see it. And then we'll roll it out to our different sites where our employees are working in person so that we can get our systems down for testing employees on a regular basis. This is for surveillance testing only, not for people who have any kind of symptoms. We do, our employees do have to do um, you know, the daily symptom check, and we have to follow all the precautions for everyone when they're on site, including the masking, the distancing, all of that as well, too. And so um, we are rolling out that testing. And of course, Contra Costa County Health Services has free COVID testing at multiple sites, including one in Pittsburgh for anyone as well, too. I know other people in the panel are looking at um, things that are maybe bubbling up because I'm, I'm getting a little bit behind now. But one more, Janet, for me real quick is uh, marching band considered a sport. I know that you talked a little bit in the beginning um, for people who are here about the sports, um, maybe a little bit about marching band, the question seems to be. You know, that's a great question. I don't have the latest up, uh, um, information on marching band. So that is something that we'll have to get and get back to folks on. I do not have the latest information on that. There is a question about, are we planning to waive the additional $750 per student that the governor has promised by not returning students by March 19th? Yeah, the numbers aren't quite like that. So there's two things. You have to um, be able to, um, physically be, able, be allowed to be open because of the case rate. So right now we're not. We could still apply and then we would get a prorated amount depending on when we were able to um, open for in-person, right? And so there's two different deadlines and then there's another deadline in March as well too to apply for that. And then the amount is not, um, wouldn't be that same amount with that. So it's not necessarily, it's not a waiver. It is um, an amount that if you are able to open and meet all the requirements, including um, weekly or twice a month testing of all students and employees, then you are able to um, apply for that. And again, that still has to get approved by the legislature. So there's still that is the that what's out there right now, but there could be some changes in that in those deadlines as well. And then one I think we have an obvious answer to is just whether we whether we acknowledge that remote learning is less effective than in person learning. And of course, we do. We would like to see our kids back in school, right? Yeah, everybody would love to have um, in person learning. You know, we know that that's the the best way. Of course, is for students and in, in, in teachers and counselors and principals. All of us miss having um, our scholars on site, and we know that in person person is the most effective. And we focused on doing the best that we could during distance learning to make sure that we could keep up um, the student engagement and learning for our scholars. 
I think Jeff, um, there's a couple of questions and they're posed in different ways, but vaccines and requiring vaccines um, specifically for students. So right now there, um, we don't, there, that wouldn't be something that we would do. We will wait and see if the state does that. So the state may make that decision or not. Right now, vaccines are only approved for um, those who are 16 and over. So there are not any vaccines approved for younger ages. Vaccines right now are only approved for 16 and over and they are optional for everybody. They are not a requirement. Ventilation in classrooms. Some classrooms don't have windows that open. Um, some questions about HVAC as well. Yeah, and Matt can jump on, but in general, what we're doing with HVAC is an analysis of all of our systems, and then we replace the filters if they don't already have them with the most, the, um, the, the, the filter the, that the system can handle, the highest filter that the system can handle. And then we've also ordered a number of um, standalone uh, air filters. You may have one in your house, you may have seen those before, but we've ordered some that are for classroom sizes so that we'll be able to put um, standalone filters in the different classrooms where we don't have enough of that HVAC filtration. And Matt Velasco, I'm gonna call on you in case to make sure I, I did my HVAC vocabulary correctly. <laughs> Absolutely. Good, good evening, everyone. I'm, I'm, I'm Matt Velasco, Director of Maintenance Operations and Transportation. And uh, Janet did a phenomenal job of really nailing those questions. You hit it everything right on the head. We will put the filters in to the highest rating that they can handle, and we have those filtration uh, standalone units ready to go. Thank you, Janet. Thank you. A couple of questions, and you answered this previously, but just so um, for anyone who may have came late um, about hybrid and returning. There's questions about spring, summer, and fall hybrid uh, learning and, and will we go back? We all, we all have those same questions and it's all gonna be based on um, a couple of things. First and foremost, the science and the data. So we're gonna use those requirements on the initial slides that I showed with you. So Kevin, if you could go back a couple slides. Oh. To, yep, so. the tier, to the tiered system. We're going to go, so that will be the number one criteria, right? So when we're in red, that's the one that is the, um, that will have the most availability in terms of opening across the district at the different grade levels, right? In purple, there's a lot of different requirements, um, not where we are now, but even within the purple, there are some exceptions for some younger grades in red than would be where we would look for, um, for where we could do it for all grades. So that would be the first thing. And then of course, we need to assess the, um, the, um, um, the preference for our community to see how many scholars are going to be in the hybrid and how many would remain in distance learning because that will impact how we allocate our staffing as well too to support that and some of those logistics. And so it's just gonna really depend on that. That's why it's very, we're trying to plan ahead as much as we can, keep everyone informed, and then really use the, the case rate. If you can go back, I mean, go forward to one other, two more slides. This one, oh, and then one more with the chart. So you can see here with the gold when we're in that area, that's where we will have the, the data and where the California Department of Public Health says that school districts are able to open at all grade levels following all of the cohort guidance, the hybrid model, all of those different pieces. That's where we will have that piece of the science. The green is where with a number of different requirements, we might be eligible at some of the um, younger grades as well. So again, we'll look at, we'll keep the science and that data first and foremost. And of course, that's why we want to review everything with you all again in mid late February, give you the update because things are changing and then tell you more so that you can really digest and see what hybrid would look like. And then start pulling to see where our families are in terms of um, 
what people are feeling in terms of wanting to have hybrid or wanting to wait. And again, we won't have the, um, don't have any information on the vaccine distribution at this time, other than we know that educators are in the next tier, but don't know when that timeline will be for when they're able to receive vaccinations yet. I think you just said it, but just for clarity purposes, there are some questions. Um, will there be an option? I know there's a preference, but will there be an option for families who choose to keep their students at home? Yes, we will, um, we will always have that option for to remain in distance learning. It might not look exactly like it looks now, depending on how many of our teachers need to do hybrid versus how many are going to remain in distance learning. But yes, that will, always, that will remain an option for families. And people, I think maybe someone came late, but there is a specific question for football and baseball, but you did talk in general about sports. Again, the tiered system maybe is a reminder for anyone who came in late. Yeah, and maybe um, Mr. Strom is on here or you, Mr. Molina, if one of you two want to answer the athletic question, feel sure. free. Yeah, I'll go ahead and answer. Um, you know, things are just like schools are very fluid and, and sort of changing on a, on a daily basis. Just yesterday, the stay-at-home order was lifted, which um, does allow schools and districts to start planning sports. So there will actually be a board presentation tomorrow evening where we discuss some, some of those issues uh, for the upcoming seasons. And just to be clear, in the, in the fall, we have had sports that can have the pods outside specifically um, practicing and conditioning safety um, with, with practical safety and distancing measures. Okay. Any more themes or we could continue on with the academic supports and then come back to any questions as well too? A, a couple of themes around clear and comprehensive plans that are available for people to review about what it, what it might look like when we open is one and the other is around disinfecting schools and how comprehensive, of, do we have a plan that people can actually visit online to see how what kind of a comp comprehensive plan we have around disinfecting schools appropriately. Around the disinfecting. Well, in terms of what it would look like, we have our um, schedules for hybrid learning through and some explanations we did at webinars in the summer. And we have some examples of what the schedules would look like. And then when we, we will review those in more detail in like mid late February, but we do have those for folks to look at. They are on our website. Um, as well, so that you can see that. And also um, the former webinars are on there as well too, where we walk through what those hybrid schedules would look like um, as well. So you could see that in the meantime. And then in terms of a disinfecting schedule, we certainly do have one and we have protocols. We're required to have a, what's called a CPP. We're going to be, um, it has to be posted by February 1st. And so you'll be able to see that on our website as well too. Our current version of it is up right now. And then we have to follow what are called California OSHA, their um, standards for employees in the workplace. And so we get clear guidance around and directives around what we have to do. We also have specific requirements on the types of materials that we're allowed to use in cleaning and disinfecting. We did do a video to show some of these things and so I think it would be good um, to make sure that we make that visible to show how we're doing some of the cleaning and disinfecting. And then again, Mr. Belasco, if you wanna jump in and talk about a little bit about the cleaning and disinfecting that we do now and then what we have prepared. Yes, thank you, Dr. Schultz. So the, um, right now the custodial team is uh, currently working a daily disinfecting our sites um, we do use a, a green disinfectant at, at, at all of our um, sites. The sites are all of the um, locations where staff are, are disinfected nightly. All of the high touch surfaces, such as doorknobs, light switches, um, desks, things like that are being disinfected um, each, uh, each evening. So we're continuing that process and we will continue that process as Dr. Schultz mentioned, we do have those videos that we did, and I uh, will um, remind to get that back on the uh, district webpage. And then in terms of the hybrid, I mean, there are, um, like I said, there's lots of pros and cons with it. And so 
we will, when we have a follow-up in February and really walk through the latest version of those as well too, we wanna make sure um, that families have all of the information. And then we get a sense from you all when you're gonna be comfortable sending your child back to school, because that's gonna be a big um, piece of data that we need to inform how to best provide educational services for the entire district with the um, staff that we have. And I think you did answer this, but someone's asking, why do we, why use Pittsburgh data if the governor says we can use Contra Costa data? Are we changing the goalpost or the finish line? And I think what you were showing is that neither Contra Costa nor the district is, is yet in a position to open. Correct. Um, neither are. And why we made the decision to also use Pittsburgh data is because we want to make sure that we're being aware and mindful of how this is impacting our community in Pittsburgh. The geography of Pittsburgh is such that you know we're not spread out way out like a lot of other districts. We are contained within that city of Pittsburgh. And so we wanna make sure that we're being very cautious and also looking at that data. The state and the county also uses data and um, it's a good, good reminder, I should bring this up for the next one, where you can see they use census data and you can see sort of the high risk communities and you can see a big um, red bubble around Pittsburgh around um, Richmond, around um, San Pablo. There's some different areas in the county. And so we wanna just be mindful of the risk factors that are much greater in our community than the average. So that's why we made the decision to constantly present that data and use that data as well to inform us. But the county right now is not in that um, position to be opening right now either. And regarding the learning pods, a couple questions about how does one get identified or, or get students into a learning pod or to a learning opportunity that, that's in person? Right now, we are um, selecting those students and families based on need. So it is not an open enrollment or application process for that. Um, there, there are more questions. Perhaps we want to, uh, I mean, we have captured them. Um, so I think we probably want to make sure that we continue to answer them with other questions. But do you want to take a few more now or should we move along, do you think? I would say let's go through the rest of the information and see if that helps answer some of the questions. And then I can also look in the Q&A um, to respond to anything. And then we'll, we'll break. Um, from the rest of the information, we'll make sure we're done and leave a good you know, 20 minutes at the end to answer any other questions and then also do the poll. So I believe we have Ms. Velasco, Shelly Velasco is gonna review some of the supports that we have for our elementary students during the um, distance learning time. And also a lot of these are available during the regular school time as well too. So make thank you, Dr. Schultz, appreciate it. Uh, thank you parents for being here. My name is Shelly Velasco. I'm the coordinator for elementary instruction. I've been in Pittsburgh Unified School District for 24 years. I also uniquely have a fifth grader and a second grader at home. And I wanna just start off by appreciating you who just like me every single day are trying to do the best we can to teach and to balance and provide that emotional support at home. Tonight, I wanna to take an opportunity as my colleagues will as well to highlight a couple of opportunities that you do have in case you were not aware. My information is on the screen below in this, uh, uh, presentation will be available for you. So in case you miss any points or you'd like to contact me, please do feel um, ready and prepared. I'd be happy to speak with you. 
three uh, picture icons that are on your Clever account. Some of those you may be intimately aware of and be using them often. Others uh, you may have seen and not know, but all of these are available to you. We have iReady lessons, both in reading and math for all of our scholars um, from K to five in both, again, reading and math. And that's that little cube icon. Your students know how to log on and go with their lessons that are appropriate to their level. We also offer the little robot guy, more affectionately known, known as our RAS kids or our learning A to Z, and that is specifically geared for students from kindergarten through third grade. Um, and that is an online reading platform with thousands and thousands of books at your students reading level. Imagine Learning um, is also offered and Sandra Guardado will go more into that in just a moment. We also have some of our schools, some after school intervention via Zoom and expanded learning, which we do offer. And again, right now, the most important piece for those who have young learners, our preschool, TK and kindergarten is to read with them. I know it's difficult with the electronic time, any books that you have in your home, just talking to them and reading them, reading to them is a huge support. So again, thank you for all that you do. I will turn it over to my colleague, Deborah Petrick. Welcome everyone. Um, it's good to see you here tonight. It looks like we, uh, we clicked on the elementary distance learning schedule link. Um, if we could go back to the slideshow to the secondary supports, that would be Fabulous. Um, but I'm Deborah Petrick. I'm the coordinator of secondary instruction. Um, so I work with our secondary schools um, to support your students' learning. Um, and I too, I've been in the district for 17 years and I too have a, a fifth grader. So I understand the, uh, the trials and tribulations of, of distance learning at home. Um, and we are doing our best to, to serve those needs. Um, so academic supports um, that are available. I know the slide is not quite up on the screen yet, um, but those academic supports, there we are, wonderful. Those academic supports that we have for secondary schools, there are some that span grades six through 12, and then some that are only for grades six through eight, and some for grades nine through 12. Um, for our six through 12, um, uh, grade levels, we do have some expanded learning opportunities um, that students can access to receive additional supports via Zoom with their teachers uh, before or after school. Um, additionally, we also have those online curricular resources in history, ELA, math, and world languages. So these are your students' textbooks that are available online that have additional resources uh, within the textbooks, those are all available through Clever that students can all access. Uh, Blueprint Fellows is another resource that we have as well for math intervention and support. So students who are struggling within their math classes have the opportunity to work directly with a Blueprint tutor in sixth through eighth grades, as well as at Pittsburgh High School with, um, if they're struggling within Algebra One. These programs are offered during the school day as well as after school uh, for those students, again, who are really struggling in math. Um, PAPER is a tutoring, uh, <coughs> excuse me, service available for all core subject areas. This is a service that students can access through their Clever account. So they just need to go to their homepage in Clever, click on the PAPER icon, and then they can connect with a tutor um, through chat, only through chat, and get direct help at any time of the day or evening with any questions that they have on any subject area. Um, grades six through eight, they have additional supports in iReady instruction, um, ELA, and that's for ELA reading and math. Um, that instruction is based on their um, how well they're doing on the tests within their ELA classroom, those diagnostic tests they take at the beginning of the year and that they have just been finishing right now. In grades nine through 12, Imagine Math is available for Algebra One and Geometry. And this is similar to iReady instruction for those um, high school parents who are familiar with iReady from their students' middle school experience. Um, it offers tutorial and instruction for students within those subject areas 
based off of a diagnostic test that they can take. And um, also within that program, there are tutors available to help students pass um, certain lessons or achieve mastery in certain lessons if they're struggling with a particular concept. So all of those are available um, for academic supports within our grades six through 12. If you have any additional questions, my information is below that you can certainly contact me to ask those questions. Also, all of our principals and assistant principals at our middle school and high schools um, support these programs as well. Thank you. And I will pass it off to Ms. Guardado, our EL coordinator for, um, our coordinator for English learner programs and dual immersion programs. Good evening, parents. Um, I know that it is a difficult time, especially for our students who are developing and mastering uh, proficiency in languages, whether it's English or Spanish. Um, and so things that we have been committed to providing additional resources for this group of students, um, as you have heard from both Deborah and Shelley, there are services that have been provided from all of, to all of our students. These are specifically for students who fit under this program. Um, and so we do have Imagine Learning that is a service that's offered to all of our students to develop and continue the uh, fluency of developing um, their language. Uh, but we do have additional licenses that have been provided for our students who are learning either English or Spanish through Rosetta Stone. We've also offered small groups that have been essentially targeted for students to continue that support uh, for my students who are learning Spanish. We have also offered um, every Tuesday with the exception of today, because I am here with you tonight, uh, we have offered uh, story time with them in the evenings um, so that th we have another opportunity for them to engage with the language as well as review kind of the fundamental um, concepts that we need to reassure them um, and also give them an opportunity to practice. So just like um, Shelly and Deborah mentioned, my contact information is at the bottom. Please feel free to contact me for our students who are in our in English learner program. We are also offering a new program that is going to be addressing some of that social emotional needs. Uh, information was mailed to the parents and phone calls are being made to invite students to participate in this program. So thank you so much. We'll pass it on to Kevin to talk about information technology. Um, good evening. My name is Kevin Rokep and I'm coordinator of data reporting and educational technology. Um, obviously with remote learning, there's been a need sometimes for techn technological help. Um, your, first, your first line is always, of course, the teacher. There may be a simple answer to any issues that you're having. But if the teacher is busy in class or can't resolve the issue, they will help um, share your issue with site administrators or you can contact the school. But we also have tech staff who can help. There's a help desk phone line at 925-473-2468. Um, each school has a site assignment of an IT person. Um, we'll also add, there's not on this slide right now, but there's actually a, a, a simple email address. It's just tech help, all one word techhelp at pittsburghusd.net. And that goes to IT um, personnel as well. So again, that's techhelp at pittsburghusd.net. And all of this information will be posted on the website. So next we have uh, Kuha who can uh, discuss special education. Good evening, everyone. So I wanted to, my name is Kuha Ha, the director of special education wanted to share with you a couple upcoming um, events that we have here in the special ed department. Number one, we do have our special education parent training night that's coming up. Um, it will be on February 24th in the evenings at six o'clock to seven. So please feel free to contact Dr. Shakira Durham for uh, additional information. Uh, next, we also have our our uh, Pittsburgh families of students with autism, who is, which is led by Ms. Sarah Watson. So feel free to contact her here at this website, or you may go ahead and click on this link and uh, which leads to the website. Third, we also have our junior high uh, speech boot camp, and, which is led by our two junior high speech pathologists, Ms. Melanie Salceda Fleming, as well as Ms. Valencia Cleveland. And these are their um, these are their uh, emails, so feel free to connect with them. Um, 
if your scholar or your child is at that level and attends junior high to access um, um, speech, uh, speech and language at supplemental services that they're providing there. Um, next, we also have our Special Olympics and Unified Sports um, led by Ms. Maureen Matson. So look out for upcoming events on her website. She also has the Pitt Unified uh, Facebook and her Instagram. So um, next month we'll include a 49ers event. So please uh, stay tuned. That looks really exciting. Lastly, we also have our Deaf and Hard of Hearing Pittsburgh Scholars in our specialized programs. Um, you may also contact Dr. Shakira Durham for that, um, for links and additional uh, links to those events. Um, next slide, please. And this is our the listing of our staff here in the department. So should you have any questions about your, um, about your child's IEP, please contact their case manager or to best address specific needs. You can also uh, connect with their program specialists and their program specialists are uh, listed here. Shakura, who's at the um, Highlands, Highlands Preschool, Foothill and Highlands Elementary School. Lindsay, who's located at High, uh, Los Modanos, uh, Marina Vista, Stoneman and Willow Cove. Eric Hosking, who is um, assigned to uh, Parkside Elementary and the three junior highs, Hillview, Martin Luther King and Rancho. And Mr. Dasho Gertis, um, assigned to the high schools at Pittsburgh and Black Diamond. And uh, non-public schools is assigned to John Zamora. Uh, feel free to contact us should you have any questions or any concerns. And you may also contact me here at the office at the, this is my information as well as my clerical staff here in the office. Thank you. Good evening. Uh, my name is Dr. Tracy Cataldi, and with my phenomenal colleague, Dr. Rejoice Frazier Myers, we are happy to uh, support you and the amazing work that you're doing each and every day to support your students. Uh, at our sites, as you can see before you, we have a huge array of support at every one of our schools, uh, and we in collaboration with our parent family liaisons and Ms. Uh, Pariciato, we are also partnering to offer a variety of workshops uh, to support parents and parents and students such as mindfulness, uh, stress management, and so on. Importantly, if there's something that you need, you may reach out to myself or Dr. Frazier Myers anytime and or your school site and feel free to connect with the coordination of services facilitator or cost facilitator at your student's site. Again, don't hesitate to connect with us. My contact information is at the bottom. And I'm also gonna share with you in a couple of slides our amazing uh, parent and community resource page uh, where you can also act, access uh, an array of additional resources. Again, please do let us know how we can help and thank you for what you do to support your students and uh, wishing you all a safe and phenomenal evening. Good evening. My name is Leticia Preciado, Parent Engagement Coordinator for the district. First of all, I want to thank you, PUSD parents, for partnering with us to ensure our scholars' success during these challenging times. And I want to encourage you to continue to monitor your students' academic progress and social emotional development. And should you have any questions or concerns at any time, please do not hesitate to contact your child's teachers, your school site administrators, your school personnel, your and as you continue to offer student, your student encouragement and support, we also invite you to attend our various parent workshops and or series. And at any time, should you have any questions, my email address is right there at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to reach out to me at any time. All of the information, if we go to the next slide, for all of our workshops is available online. You'll see the link there at the top, including our positive parenting series, our teen triple P series, our parent webinars, our father talk series, our Mentes Positivas series, supporting a positive mental health, and new this year, our basic computer skills. So all of the information is constantly updated. So please look at our website. All the links are there. You can register at any time. 
Good evening. I am Chandra Johnson. I'm the coordinator of student data, and I wanted to share some information about our ARIES parent portal. So ARIES is the student information system that we use here at Pittsburgh, and parent portal is a system in which students and parents can create an account. And in creating an account, they have the ability to monitor students' academic progress. They are able to look at absences, grades, assignments. They can obtain email addresses for their students' teachers to be able to contact them directly. They can sign up for a weekly report and it will send you a progress report weekly on the day and time of your choosing. I have posted a couple of links. So one is a video that discusses what you need to do and how to create a parent portal account. And the other is the link to the parent portal site. So you can reach out to the office staff at your student school site or reach out to myself to get additional information or if you need the information to create an account. Thank you. And in addition to the ARIES parent portal, you can also monitor your students' progress through their Google Classroom. So once your student is signed into their Google Classroom, you can click where it says to do that you see on the top left-hand corner of the screen. And this will give you a summary of what work has been assigned, what work is um, maybe perhaps missing if there's any missing assignments and what work has been completed. But again, if you have any questions or concerns, please do not hesitate to contact your students' teachers, your counselors or your school site administrators. So as I referenced um, a moment ago, we have an amazing uh, resource uh, portfolio on our district website and you see the link to our website at the top of the page. And there is really just uh, an amazing array of general resources, food bank, uh, uh, medical assistance and healthcare resources. Uh, my access information uh, is also there under social, emotional and mental health resources, safety, technology, relief uh, for undocumented families and workers uh, and so on. So if there's something that you need that you do not see uh, listed, please again, don't hesitate to reach out to me uh, either by email, by telephone, uh, whatever works for you. Um, and I will get right back to you. Uh, and again, thank you so much for being here and what you do for your students every day. Hello, as stated before, my name is Rejoice Frazier Myers. I have the honor of being Director of Student Enrollment, Director of Student Services, pardon me. These are the enrollment dates and this information is online. You enroll online. If you have any questions, the information is available. You can call the numbers that are available. Enrollment dates for kindergarten are available March 10th. New students, June the 1st. Returning students, there's a link there. You'll receive that in mid-July. Open enrollment dates, inter-district dates are available for you if you elect to uh, come in to the district. You can leave too, but we prefer you didn't. Next page, please. Enrollment requirements. TK and K and new to Pittsburgh Unified School District have the following requirements. The immunization records are required, all of them by law. Unfortunately, they have not been omitted during the COVID challenge. So uh, immunization records, a physical examination is due March the 1st, dental exams after August the 15th, and proof of residence, utility bill. All seventh graders who have not had their TDAP should have it by the seventh grade. They can receive it at age seven, but they have to have it by the seventh grade, according to AB 354. The second test is required too, if not received. The next thing is if you have any questions, the key phone number is the phone number below. And then the emails are available for you if you have any questions about enrollment. 
Feel free to call student services anytime. Thank you very much, but before, thank you. Hi, I'm Shireen Sasser. I'm the workforce liaison for the district. Um, as part of my job, um, I work with the um, CTE department, the, um, the counselors within the district, and the college and career center, which is what I'm going to talk to you about today. Before I, I start, I just wanted to state if it hasn't been said already that this presentation will be available online um, shortly you know in a couple of days after and so all of the links to the emails and the websites that we've been seeing will all be right in this presentation you'll be able to just click on the link to get to the page you're looking for so the College and Career Center is based out of Pittsburgh High School. Um, hopefully it is something you have all heard about um, and will utilize when, if and when, not if, sorry, when your students are at Pittsburgh High School. Um, there are many services um, that cover pretty much everything that has to do with um, getting into college, if that's what your student is interested in, and everything, other opportunities um, besides college, if that's what your student is interested in. Um, we have connections with the military, with um, trades, um, with job opportunities, all kinds of things. Um, we also have all kinds of career information and opportunities for students to do career exploration so that they can start in high school to start maybe figuring out what they wanna do when they graduate from high school so that they have a better chance of going into college if that's where they wanna go. Um, with the right college, with the right major that will help them achieve their career goals. Um, it also will help with having um, guidance on what their options are if they don't wanna go to college or they don't wanna go right now. Um, I would like to point out that um, there is a notification system that we use that is amazing. Anytime there's an opportunity that has something to do with the college or a job or an internship or anything like that, we use Remind. Um, and in the little gray green box um, are the Remind codes. It's based on what year your student will be graduating. So far we have um, eighth grade through seniors and parents, you are more than welcome um, to sign up for any of these as well. Um, in fact, we highly encourage it. Um, at the bottom of this slide, uh, you see the pictures of Sunita, Marielle, and myself. The three of us um, kind of oversee and work together for the purposes of the College and Career Center. Next slide. Um, this is a list of upcoming workshops that um, you may be interested in. Uh, it includes um, financial aid workshops, which is FAFSA and the California Dream Act. Um, Cash for College is all about scholarships and other financial aid and community college application workshops as well. And it, those links are all on there as well. Next slide. Um, the College and Career Center also, um, in partnership with Pittsburgh High School, is, um, has a program that's just started this year called Immigrants Rising. And it's specifically to help undocumented students with all kinds of amazing support. And so um, June Park is the um, intern who is um, the Immigrant Rising Advisor, and I hope um, you'll take advantage of all of these services um, when you need us. And please do not hesitate to reach out if there's anything we can do to help you get your student prepared. Thank you. Uh, there's a comment in the chat, Shireen, that the um, notification for eighth graders does not work, the at CCC 2025. Oh. Okay, I will um, check into that and make sure that we get that working. Thank you.
Good evening. I am Angela Nava, the Director of Child Nutrition. Um, I just wanted to remind folks and um, parents as far as our meal service program that we have available. Um, we are a bit, we are distri uh, distributing meals Monday and Wednesday, 12.30 to 2.30. Now at each of the school um, site locations. Um, we, have two we have two schools, Rancho and Pittsburgh High School, um, who will be also serving 4.30 to 6.30 on Mondays only. Um, and that's to give parents the opportunity that can't make it during the day um, to make it to an evening um, distribution. Um, so hopefully that's helpful for the community. <clears throat> Kevin, this is your slide. Yeah, just confirming you were done, Angela, yes? Uh, I was just gonna point out some links that I had on the corner of the page. Uh, okay, sorry. Um, and any information, um, our, our website is, is updated uh, regularly. And again, these links are active. Um, and if there's any questions, uh, please feel free uh, to reach out to us. Thank you. As you may be aware, um, every year we do a Healthy Kids survey in the district. It's um, a very important survey for us to understand sort of the health and well-being and, and to, to get feedback and information about uh, the experiences of our students and parents in the district. Uh, it's voluntary and confidential. It helps us to understand and identify needs of children and families for the, for the development of services and programs. Um, this year, we were looking to complete our student surveys by mid-February, and the parent surveys are going to be available through March um, for, um, for parents to also take those, and we'll be sending out reminders to get as much as possible. The, the link on this, uh, the link that's here is to our Healthy Kids survey page on our district website. There you will find a link to consent forms, as well as to... Um, versions of the survey so that you can see it ahead of time before your students take the survey. Uh, what's very important is the consent form that is a link from this page. Um, in the past, you had to fill out a written form. You don't have to anymore. You can follow a link to an online form and give your permission or uh, opt out. So for fifth grade parents, because the students are younger, we need um, a form from you either way to either consent for your child to participate or to opt out. For our seventh, ninth, and 11th graders, and for all of our Black Diamond Continuation High School students, uh, we only need a form if you want to opt out. Otherwise, we assume that the student is okay to take the survey. And of course, each student needs to voluntarily take the survey as well. So um, they're given that option um, when they take the survey. So I think Anthony or Janet, do you want to uh, round out the survey or the webinar? I muted, I, muted oh. myself. So, oh, <laughs> did you have anything you want to add, Anthony, before I go? Well, just really quickly, I did. I was able to see one question in the chat. I know that uh, parents in a junior high, eight parents of eighth graders who will be going into high school next year. I know that there's some questions around registration. Um, currently, we have teachers and counselors going down to the uh, junior high schools and going into classes such as AVID and also announcing um, courses such as Puente and different offerings at the high school. I do know that um, There'll be more information coming out, but we do have um, the 17th is going to be a night where parents are going to be able to go into a webinar for course selection overview at the high school. More information will be forthcoming. And then on the 23rd, the high school is also gonna be doing an open house to give information to parents and students who are incoming. So I know it's very exciting times, maybe a little bit nervous, but you will be getting information from the high school parents of eighth graders coming soon. Anthony, I just wanted to add to that. So our current 
Eighth graders will register for high school via parent portal, and they will receive information in the summer about when the registration will open to do their data confirmation. And uh, I just I just placed in the chat a link to tonight's slide presentation. So if you click on that now, you can go through the slides that were just presented and all the live links that people shared with you. You can use them immediately. We'll also post this online, but I just wanted to make sure if you're still with us tonight, thank you for staying. And um, there's a direct link to the slideshow right now for you to view it and to use the links. Okay, thank you everyone. And, and thank you for all of the information and thank you to all of our parents and families for your questions. Tried to answer some in the Q&A as well. Just to recap a few things. So um, we are remaining in distance learning at least through March 12th, which is through our third quarter. That was a recommendation that the board approved in December and sent that communication out so that we could plan. And I know uh, along with all the planning that we have to do, I know that the families have a lot of planning that you need to do as well too. And so, we don't know when students will go back to school yet because it will be based on a few factors. Number one, it'll be based on the data that we have from the state and Contra Costa County Health and our local Pittsburgh data and where that falls within the tiers, right? So where that falls within that tiered system. And again, depending on where we are, that uh, lets us know um, when we are allowed to have any kind of the in-person hybrid learning at that time. Then we will also want to make sure that we get lots of feedback from our families about your preference. And so that will help us determine what's going to be the best course of action as well too. So a lot of information. I saw a few folks wanting to see sort of the comprehensive reopening plan. We have lots of um, portions of it on our website in terms of what the schedules would look like. We mirrored a lot of our distance learning schedules to look like it would be in, in hybrid in a sense too, in terms of the cohorts. You may have your child with part of their class for part of the day. So we did do some things like that. But when we have this next set in mid-February and talk about that mid-late February and talk more in detail of what that will look like, that's where you will be able to see it all sort of in maybe in one neat place. And then that would be helpful as well too. So we'll go through that then. But we do follow all of the um, guidelines with the California Department of Public Health. I continue to meet weekly with my counterparts, the other superintendents in Contra Costa County, our county superintendent, and then also the Contra Costa County Health Department to get the um, latest information to keep us up to date on, every, on everything. Another question I saw quite a bit was when we are able to go to some um, in-person learning, you will as a family have that choice to remain in, in distance learning. So again, you will have that choice um, as well. I did see quite a few questions about, will I still have the same teacher? Don't know, because we, you know, there's a lot of factors that play into that in terms of how many, also in terms of the um, teacher's own you know, ability to be an in-person as well too. So still lots of um, to be determined, which I know is frustrating, but know that we're working and planning all along um, in order to be ready for when the time is right. And also making sure that we're providing the best education possible during this time. Um, I appreciated all the different, there's some different suggestions in here to do some more things. So thank you, would love some more of those great suggestions for different pieces that we can do. I'm happy to have some more. And any other big questions before our poll that we didn't get to? Oh, no, students will, I saw I don't get it, they have to go back, no. So we're in full distance learning through, um, through the mid-March, which is through the third quarter. 
when the data allows and when again the board has to approve it as well too when we're ready to go back for hybrid because it won't be in person like we've known it before right it can only be certain numbers of students on time with all at one time and all the restrictions families will still have the option to remain in distance learning Shall we do the poll? I was just going to say, Kevin, I think we're ready for the poll. OK, we have a very brief poll, um, which um, you should see in just a moment. And when uh, everyone has taken the poll, we'll share the results back. Great, it looks like the first poll takers have gotten through the questions and they're slowly ticking upwards. Kevin, there's a question in the chat. Um, some people are saying, where's the poll? Um, On the bottom of your Zoom, you should be able to see a little link that says polls. Oh, oh, there's one, one question. Okay. Uh, it looks like one of the questions was supposed to be able to be multiple, multiply chosen, but it's only allowing for one choice. So I guess give us your highest priority information need. Sorry about that. Angela, I saw a question about um, the food service for the evening. So I think that's great. We have some evening times, but since they're on Monday, folks are wondering, do they get the meals for the week if, if it's on a um, Monday evening or just the two days because then we don't have the Wednesday evening? Uh, Dr. Schultz, yes, that's the correct, that would be correct. So they, when they pick up Monday evening, it's for the two days and then Wednesday um, would be where they'd pick up the second set for the week, for the rest of the week. Okay, so probably something we have to figure out for some of our families, there was, a um, if the evening is the only time they can make it, can we, how will we differentiate if they need it for the week? So that was in there. Let me think of... Let me look through if there's other ones. Let's see. I know that, you know, there's lots of concerns as we are too around. We know that in-person learning isn't the same as, um, I mean, distance learning isn't the same as in-person when we are able to have um, in-person learning. You know, of course, we're gonna continue extra supports through distance learning. But the state is allocating some funding for us to do additional learning. So we'll have to see what that looks like when we get more information from the state. But examples could be that we do have, um, you know, um, more opportunities for students to, to, you know, who need it to sort of catch up to do some, you know, um, intercession lessons when we're on break to have some more after school opportunities for learning. So we will be very mindful about the need to have more learning opportunities um, for all of our scholars once we are back in person, absolutely.
We still have some poll takers. We still have, we have about 129 folks still left in the room and about 111 who have finished the poll and I'll wait for a few more ticking off even as I speak. So I think in just a, just a minute or so we can share the poll results. Great. Thank you so much everyone for um, your interest and for making sure you spent this time with us. Really appreciate it. And of course, for all of your support. I know that this has been incredibly challenging. It looks like it's kind of slowed to a halt in terms of submissions of, we've got 112 out of 128 remaining. That's pretty good. I think we're gonna end the, end the polling in five, four, three, two, one. Okay. And here are the results. The highest result, of course, is in the um, sort of um, rust colored um, and the, sh the, the lower results are in the blue for each question. Ku, I'm looking at the um, the Q and A, and I see you have you would like to answer this question live. Under one, I don't know if that there was a Q and A, and it had you saying you wanted to answer this question live. I just want to make sure we we had given you that opportunity. I'm looking through the Q and A. Oh, okay. Let me get there. I don't. I'm a, I'm answering I'm answering families directly. It's so yeah. Easy. But there's one that says would like to answer this lot. So I just wanted to make sure. We didn't. Okay, I pass. <laughs> no, I go ahead, move on. Okay. Yeah. I, I think it's easy to click on the live by accident when you go yeah. to answer a question. Uh -oh. And, and, then, and you, can't, you can't undo that and then type an answer, unfortunately. Okay, got it. Yeah. So thank you, thank you for taking the poll and for viewing the results. And uh, are, do we want to um, have any closing words and have folks thank folks again for coming? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for coming. Um, again, we are in full distance learning. Um, we are there through the third quarter and we don't know when we'll be able to return yet. That's gonna really depend on a number of factors. The most important one being the safety of everybody, our scholars and our staff and, and everyone's families as well too, based on the information that, and the data that we have from the California Department of Public Health, we'll continue to work on that. And so while we're in this situation, we're going to continue to do the very best we can in distance learning and we can't be more grateful for all of your um, support in working with our teachers and our staff and, and juggling everything that you have to juggle during this time. We will have another set of information in mid to late February that goes into more details around what a hybrid could look like. Um, but again, we do not have any timeline for when we're gonna be able to have hybrid learning we do not have that data projected out far enough yet. And we'll just continue to update that regularly and continue to send you messages as anything changes. And we will have another um, series of webinars in mid to late February. And again, your feedback is going to be a huge determining factor in helping us um, 
plan as well too. And when it is, we don't have a date yet, but when we are able to do the hybrid and in-person, families will have the choice to remain in distance learning and you will be able to continue to use the technology that we have um, provided as well too. I think we're going to stop the recording now for the session and